This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Today is June the 7th, 2020, and we are so happy that you have found us on online worship here at Cup Church. Several uh, announcements to share with you. First of all, we do want to let you know that in light of uh, everything that's going on in our country, uh, the EPC has put out a call to prayer and fasting for tomorrow, June the 8th. We encourage you to spend some time just to pray for our country, pray for racial reconciliation, pray for our relationships in our communities and our nation, pray for our political leaders. We need the Lord. <laughs> I think we've been reminded of that in so many ways over these last few months, but that's, that's especially true now. So uh, I'm encouraging all of us to take some time tomorrow to do that. Along those same lines, you have probably heard that uh, Governor Wolf has moved Beaver County to green, and what that means for us is we will be going back to in-sanctuary, in-person worship on June the 21st. Uh, we're very excited about that. There are, are numerous things that we are still doing to protect uh, our health and the details about coming back into the sanctuary for worship. You will find that on our Facebook page. You'll find that on the web page. Just uh, a couple of things. Our rows have been moved around in a socially distant, sensitive manner. We are asking, we're, we're requiring masking on entering the church and then strongly encouraging it once we get to the sanctuary. But uh, numerous other things we can tell you. The main point is we are thrilled to have the opportunity to gather together again June the 21st. Next week will be our last week for online worship and we are excited to have as our virtual preacher, the Reverend Dr. Tom Beer, who a few of you may remember as having led our men's retreats in years past, and Tom and Rhonda led an all-church retreat for us a few years ago. So Tom is coming back to us through the technology of uh, the internet and all that good stuff, and he's got a great message for us next week. Uh, Christina and I are on vacation, but look forward to being back with you on the 21st. Finally, uh, given that this is the first week in June, we are thrilled to have the opportunity to honor three lovely graduates here uh, from Cup Church. Katie Sosnowski, Kristen Rita, and Casey Herbert. And so I have asked Katie Kristen and Casey to share a little bit about where they're graduating from and uh, either a hope or a plan they have for the future. So. I graduated from Blackhawk High School and I'm planning to attend Clarion University and majoring in art and entertainment management. Wonderful, Katie. Kristen, how about you? Hi, um, I have graduated from Edinburgh University with my master's in counseling and art therapy, and I have recently accepted a full-time art therapy job at Southwood Psychiatric Hospital, um, about 10 minutes from Bridgeville, so south of Pittsburgh, um, and I'm very excited. I'm, I'm easing into it well. Great. Thanks, Kristen. And Casey, how about you? I graduated from Slippery Rock University with degrees in early childhood and special education, and I hope to get a teaching job in Pennsylvania somewhere. Great. Uh, can we pray for our graduates? Let's pray. Gracious God, we thank you for these young women. We thank you for the gifts that you have equipped them with and for all that they have to offer uh, this world that you have made. Lord, we ask that you would cover them, guide them, sustain them, and allow them to have joy 
in the work that is in front of them, whether it's additional schooling or uh, in, in the workforce or even in other responsibilities and opportunities that may be very different from what they've studied. But Lord, you know it all and you know them. So Lord, uh, grant them every good thing we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Join me in the call to worship. Let us worship God, our light and our salvation, for the Lord is the stronghold of our lives. We come with shouts of joy to sing and make music to the Lord. Let us worship God in spirit and in truth. And may you teach us your ways and make straight our paths in this hour and always.
can stand against us if our God is for us. Neither hide nor death can separate us. Hell and death will not defeat us. He who gave his son. grateful that we can come into your presence. You are our source of hope, of joy, of comfort. Everything that we have and everything that we hope to be lies in your hands, and we're thankful that you are the kind of floor that you are. When the music fades, all is stripped away, and I simply come, longing just to bring something that's of worth, that will bless your heart. I'll bring you more than a song. For a song in itself is not what you have required. You search much deeper within, through the way things appear. You're looking into my heart. I'm coming back to the heart of worship, and it's all about you. All about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I made it. But it's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus.
Friends, we long to worship and listen to the Lord speak to us. Yet we also long to share what is in our hearts and with him as well. God is perfectly lovingly and perfectly just. This is what we understand holiness to be. All of us fall short of Lord's holiness and we need to be forgiven. Yet God is willing to hear our prayer and to renew us for a life of joy and service. Will you pray with me? Together saying, Lord God, you've told us that the student cannot be greater than the master, and that if we follow you, we can expect difficulty as well as joy, sorrow as well as laughter. You have also told us that there will be times when we are called to go where you may not want to go and do what we fear doing. Forgive our fear and our stubbornness, Lord. Open us in our ever greater measure to trust and obey as we bring to you our silent prayers of confession. Amen. Friends, hear the good news. Jesus Christ has come into the world to save sinners, and that includes you and me. The Bible tells us the wages of sin is death, but God's gift is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The work he began in us, he promises to bring to completion, and he has the power and the willingness to do it. For if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just and will forgive us and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Friends, believe the good news. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Our focus this morning is on our life together as a community of faith and how God calls us to live our lives. Our creed this morning comes from the Westminster Confession of Faith, chapter 26, the opening paragraph. Let us say what we believe. All believers are united to Jesus Christ, their head, by his spirit and by faith and have fellowship with him in his grace, suffering, death, resurrection, and glory. United to one another in love, the saints have fellowship in each other's gifts and grace, and are obliged to perform those public and private duties which nourish their mutual good, both spiritually and physically. Our scripture passage for this morning comes from Paul's letter to the Romans. This really comes close to the end of the book, portions of chapters 14 and 15. Starting in chapter 12, <clears throat> Paul has been giving practical applications for living the Christian life. And as we get to 14 and 15, he is talking about two separate groups of people within the Roman church, the strong and the weak. Just uh, selecting verses out of 14 and then the first seven verses of chapter 15. 
Except him whose faith is weak, without passing judgment on disputable matters. One man considers one day more sacred than another. Another man considers every day alike. Each one should be fully convinced in their own mind. He who regards one day as special does so to the Lord. He who eats meat eats to the Lord, for he gives thanks to God. And he who abstains does so to the Lord and gives thanks to God. For none of us lives to themselves alone, and none of us dies to ourselves alone. If we live, we live to the Lord. And if we die, we die to the Lord. So, whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. Verse 13. Therefore, let us stop passing judgment on one another. Instead, make up your mind not to put any stumbling block or obstacle in your brother's way. As one who is in the Lord Jesus, I am fully convinced that no food is unclean in itself. But if anyone regards something as unclean, then for him it is unclean. If your brother is distressed because of what you eat, you are no longer acting in love. Do not by your eating destroy your brother for whom Christ died. Do not allow what you consider good to be spoken of as evil. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Because anyone who serves Christ in this way is pleasing to God and approved by men. Let us therefore make every effort to do what leads to peace and a mutual edification. Chapter 15. We who are strong ought to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. Each of us should please his neighbor for his good to build him up. For even Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the insults of those who insult you have fallen on me. For everything that was written in the past was written to teach us, so that through endurance and the encouragement of the Scriptures, we might have hope. May the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you a spirit of unity amongst yourselves as you follow Christ Jesus, so that with one heart and mouth you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Accept one another then just as Christ accepted you in order to bring praise to God. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Gracious God, I ask that as we consider your word and as we consider our lives in this country and in this moment, that you will allow your Holy Spirit to shape us and speak to us and allow us to follow after you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. So, there's a, a meme that I've seen uh, using pictures from Michael Scott of The Office and uh, the woman who's the lead character in Parks and Recreation. And in the first one, it says, Week One Online Worship. There's Michael Scott behind a desk in a coat and tie, pleasant smile on his face. And then you get another picture of him, and there's this crazy bandana, and his eyes are bloodshot, and about four or five days growth beard, and, and he's clearly beyond the edge of his rope. His rope snapped a long time ago. And at the bottom of, of this, it says, Online Worship Week 11. I don't even know what week we're on, but there definitely has been sort of a sense of, oh, we are getting to the breaking point, not just with doing things like this, but every part of our lives. We have, we have put forward an incredible effort as a state, as a nation, but still... The jury is out on so many things regarding uh, 
what it is that we're still facing regarding uh, the coronavirus, whether it's going to come back uh, to infect a lot more people. If it does, how serious is it going to be? What do we need to do in the midst of, of this time where there are things we don't know? And even the things we think we do know, people are coming to very different opinions. Throw on top of that the most serious racial riots and demonstrations that we have seen in decades. People are really comparing this moment to 1968, which is probably the most serious year in my lifetime in American history. So when does personal preference become a personal issue where we are rubbing others in a really wrong way or feel like we are? Or are we looking at things that are secondary or foundational in nature? So Thomas Jefferson says, uh, in matters of style, swim with the current. In matters of substance, stand like a rock. So what is style and what is substance? That's a key issue uh, and so we're talking about keeping first things first. We're going to look at an issue that Paul had with this with the Roman church and then see what it means for us today. So we're looking at don't despise or condemn. We're looking at family over food choice. And then ultimately, when Christ comes first, he makes us one. So what do I mean when we say don't despise or condemn? Well, Paul is talking to a multi-ethnic church that is dealing with different ways of coming out of their belief systems of the past. So one group was Jewish, and they had certain food that was kosher and certain particular holy days that they had kept. And in coming to Christ, Christ had made all foods clean, and we looked at that, look at that in Acts chapter 10. And we are called to not separate between Jews and Gentiles. Well, there were some who were new to the faith, coming out of the Jewish faith, that to eat food that they had been told all their lives was unclean was extremely difficult. Then there was another group that uh, there was food that had been sacrificed to Roman idols. And the idea was if you were part of a community feast and, and all of the food basically had been sacrificed in sort of a social way to these idols, was it displeasing to God? I mean, was it what what Catholics might call a mortal sin to do this or not. So some said yes and some said no. And for Jews, keeping kosher uh, or even meeting, eating meat at all was an issue. So Paul is talking about these two groups of people. As Paul writes in these first four verses, which we didn't look at all of them, he says to one group, don't despise the other. To the other, he says, don't condemn. Let's unpack this a little bit. The group that was called the strong, which recognized in Christ they could eat all kinds of food, they were tempted to despise as ignorant or small-minded those that still had scruples about kosher food or food sacrificed to idols. They basically said, you guys just don't understand the freedom that we have. Get with the program and I'm, you know, you're just ridiculous or, you know, I despise you for taking such an approach and causing problems. For the other group, they condemned this group because they said, you are breaking the Old Testament law. How dare you? We know Christ is the way but he is the fulfillment of the law, and you are, you are destroying the church by doing these things. So 
back and forth these two sides were going, and Paul saying, this is not a primary issue. Don't despise or condemn each other over things that are somewhat significant, but they are not the main point of who we are in Christ. And so he goes on to say, you are family first, and that's more important than the food choices you make. And so he talks about some of these different uh, differences of opinion. One considers one day more sacred than another. Jews typically had the holy day sundown on Friday. Christians were already worshiping on Sundays. Uh, for some, it was about the type of meat or no meat that they were eating, so on and so forth. But Paul talks about uh, the fact that Christ has died for all of us, and he refers to us, meaning the church, together over and over and over again. Now, Paul is saying, look, I'm not asking you to throw your minds away when you come to faith in Christ. You've got to be fully convinced in your mind. I'm not asking you to violate your conscience over something that you really believe is wrong. It says be convinced in your mind, but be convicted in your identity. Verses 7 and 8. None of us live to ourselves alone. None of us die to ourselves alone. If we live, we live to the Lord. We die to the Lord. Whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. In other words, okay, how you live your life, you're trying to sort that out, but your life has been bought and paid for by the blood of Christ. And so that is the bottom line. We belong to God through Jesus Christ and that is the primary level of obedience and unity that we've got to follow. Be convinced in your mind, yes, but you've got to be convicted in your identity. This is not every person for themselves. Ultimately, we are family in Christ. And Paul really drives that home when uh, we get to chapter 15. Paul himself clearly comes out on the side that he believes is right, which he calls the strong, people that eat all things, recognizing everything is a gift from God, and, and he knows that uh, all of this food ultimately belongs to him. But he is saying, if I'm with somebody that has really got a problem with that, I am not going to flaunt my freedom to such an extent that they just feel terrible and maybe even are driven out of the church altogether because they are shocked by my behavior. Paul's basically saying, I'm willing to accept insults as Jesus accepted insults in order to keep the family together in Christ where it belongs. Accept one another just as Christ has accepted you in order to bring praise and glory to God. Let me talk a little bit about uh, one particular story where my mind was changed on this. I was convinced in my mind, but ultimately my mind was moved and I was convicted in my identity. As a kid, um, Nobody had to wear seat belts. And as I drove the car as a teenager, I was very happy to not wear a seat belt. I knew I was fine. I knew there wasn't going to be a problem. And so maybe once in a while when my parents were in the car, I'd wear it. But more often than not, that thing just stayed where it was. Well, my dad was a driver's education teacher. And so he was exposed to a lot of information regarding accidents and teenagers not wearing seatbelts and all that stuff. And he would say, Scott, you've got to wear your seatbelt. It's important for you to wear your seatbelt. It's dangerous for you not to wear your seatbelt. And I was like, okay, whatever, Dad. 
I know you're right. And so I would put it on when I was in the car with him, but that was about it. One day when I was in college, I got a letter from my dad. And my dad would write fairly often, and I mean, this was back when people actually wrote on things called paper and envelopes, and you got it in the U.S. mail, okay? So anyway, I open up this letter from my dad, and the only thing it said was, Scott, I love you. Please wear your seatbelt. Dad. And whether it was the age I finally was or whether there was something about just the appeal from his heart, I changed my behavior. I moved from just being like, oh, I'm, I'm sure I'm okay, to, you know, my identity is here and I don't want to hurt my dad. And I guess you could say my mind was changed, but I was convicted in my deeper identity, and it changed me. So let me just take a couple of minutes to talk about the moment that we are now in in a culture regarding uh, issues around staying safe and the virus in our midst. For some, there is a great concern about social distancing, wearing a mask, sanitizing hands, for others, there's a sense of, man, I need to get back to work. I need a job a lot more than worrying about the risk of this virus, or I just I don't want to be bothered with all of the things I got to think about in terms of wearing a mask and where I wear it and all that stuff. And there is a temptation for us, especially after several weeks of this, and now as we open up but are still told, well, we've got to keep these things in mind, but, but we, are, we have a lot more freedom than we did. The temptation is to look at one group or another and say, you know, they're really not paying attention to the science, or, you know, they're not really paying attention to the, the needs of the economy, and I could die from a whole lot of other things a lot quicker than if, if I, you know, am staying at home because of this virus. Friends, I pray that we don't presume ignorance or stubbornness on people that are taking slightly or even significantly different approaches to this issue from our own. If you're someone that feels uh, wearing a mask or, or some of the, the stringent things about this have been too much, we don't know for someone else who's taking a more conservative approach what their personal health situation is, even if they are a younger person. Or we don't know who is a part of their regular network of interaction. They could be very concerned about a loved one and passing on something that isn't going to hurt them but could kill someone close to them. On the other hand, if we are taking we're being very careful with masking and, and uh, all of the other things regarding staying safe, and we see someone who's not masking, we may need to recognize there are other issues, respiratory issues, allergy issues, that cause people uh, wearing masks a great deal of difficulty uh, to the point where it's really hard for them to go out with that sort of thing. Point is, we don't know the whole story, especially about total strangers or people we're only merely acquainted with when it comes to this issue. And I think what Paul is saying about, all right, be convinced in your own mind, but know that you are the Lord's and ultimately you are one in Christ is important for us to hang on to as we move forward as a congregation much less as a community of faith. So let me move on then uh, to unpack verses 1 through 7 a little bit more. When Christ comes first, he makes us one. Well, what does Paul mean by that? Notice that Paul says, each of us should please our neighbor for his good to build him up 
because Christ didn't please himself. As it is written, the insults of those who insult you have fallen on me. There are things where we may feel like, you know, I don't, I don't uh, need to worry about whether or not I pick up this particular uh, virus. I'm likely to even be in better shape if I, if I am resistant to it afterwards. To go ahead and, and mask anyway because, and, and this was actually persuasive to me, when I learned that the masking was not so much about keeping me safe as to help somebody else feel safer. There is an act of humility, honestly, in wearing one of those things. It's impossible to look good in it. You feel like people can't understand you. And so there's sort of a sense of, look, I don't need a mask because y'all need to hear exactly what I'm saying, and I'm always going to be able to deliver stuff that isn't going to make anybody sick, so leave the mask at home when it comes to me. Well, the mask is actually an act of humility. Now, on the other hand, um, to shame people into wearing the mask is uh, really not getting us where Jesus wants us to be either. And I think it's worth asking the question, I'm going to come back to this in a minute, are you receiving the right insults? What I mean by that is, if you were to state in social media, here is what I believe, or here is how I will act, and you could even put something on like, my eyes are blue, or I like left-handed people. If people make comments about it, ultimately, you will start getting insulted. That is just the way of the world, unfortunately. In a fallen and sinful world, all of us will get insulted for any position that we take. What I mean by are you receiving the right insults is, uh, are you looking out for the vulnerable or the needy, and are people, would they insult you because... They feel like you are a softy. Or are you insulted because people see you as cruel and vindictive? So when Christ comes first, he makes us one. He's willing to take insults upon himself in order to bring us into his family. And Paul says, keep your eyes on the prize. It's a lot more than about uh, whether or not people around you are a certain distance away from you or what they are or aren't wearing, it is about keeping our eyes on Jesus. Five and six, may the God who gives endurance and encouragement also give you a spirit of unity. Friends, we need endurance right now. It's easy for us to feel like, hey, we're done and kind of let down and and then find that our tempers have become incredibly short because we've been picking ourselves up by our own bootstraps. We need to get beyond our own inclinations or our own private preferences and continue to look to the Lord who did not consider personal privilege uh, something he was pursuing, but was willing to take insults even to the point of death in order to bring us into himself. He is the epitome of endurance and encouragement, and he can keep us together. With one heart and mouth, we may glorify the God and Father of our Lord, Jesus Christ. Paul is saying, look, I know you're not of one mind on some of these other things, but when you're all looking at the cross, when you're all looking at the one who poured out his Holy Spirit on you, we can be one. Okay. I'm talking about first things first. And this is a slightly different topic, but it is related. And I've got to take a couple of minutes before I let you go today. And that is, uh, as we think about Jesus Christ unifying us and him taking on insults in order to tie us together, 
as we look at the issues of race in our country that have really been tearing us apart for the last couple of weeks, racial reconciliation is a foundational issue. For those of you who had the opportunity to look at the devotional that I posted yesterday on Luke chapter 4, let me just go back to that for a moment. Opening words of Jesus' ministry, and he's talking to his hometown church, and he quotes from Isaiah, they hand him the scroll from Isaiah, and he talks about the year of the Lord's favor is a place where the eyes of the blind are opened. The prisoner is released. But then he also talks about the poor. And you would think, well, if the blind gets sight and the prisoner gets freedom, don't the poor get money? No. Jesus talks about, I have come to give good news to the poor. Poverty isn't a lack of money as far as Jesus is concerned. Poverty is a lack of information. And what is that information? Well, uh, when Jesus ends part one of his little speech, the hometown crowd says, hey, this guy is awesome, isn't he? Mary and Joseph's son, we always knew he'd turn out great. They think that he's giving a message of make Israel great again. But then he says that God is coming to bring good news to people outside their own race or ethnicity. He talks about how God in the Old Testament healed Naaman the Syrian and the widow of Zarephath. And that's why the crowd turned so quickly from loving Jesus to wanting to throw him off a cliff. Matters of race have caused uh, friction and violence for centuries, and it's not just white and black. But friends, here's, here's the rub of it. Jesus Christ has said, the good news for the Jewish people is not just for the Jews. It is to cross into every racial background. And praise God for that, because I haven't had an official DNA test, but I don't think there's a whole lot of uh, kosher blood running through these veins. Um, the other part of it is, Jesus crossed not only racial lines, but the triune God who is without sin in perfect fellowship was willing to cross that line to give the good news of great joy to us as people. God cares deeply about us crossing racial lines with the good news, and we need to receive good news and to see where we've fallen short as well as perhaps give it. There's a whole lot more on this issue than we can finish unpacking either last week or this week or for a while. It's a journey, and it's one that continues even after the cameras stop rolling on whatever the latest problem has been. But friends, know this, that no virus, no racial violence, no poverty can keep the God of Jesus Christ of Nazareth from reaching out to us and giving us what we desperately need. Forgiveness, salvation, hope, and joy. Put your hands in the hand of the crucified and risen Savior. That is the first thing. That is the last thing. And the implications of that will carry us through the rest of our lives. Let's pray. Gracious God, we, we have to bend the knee when we look at the overwhelming needs and challenges facing us personally and in our nation. 
Lord, when it, when it comes to matters of the haves and the have-nots, um, it just feels overwhelming and there is uh, frustration and fear and agendas that are so diverse, I, it makes one's head spin. Lord, we are lost without you. Father, we pray that you would give wisdom and humility to our political leaders, both president, senators, representatives, governors, uh, local politicians. Lord, give them wisdom. We pray for uh, our uh, policemen and women who are seeking to provide order and structure in a society that seems as though it is coming apart at the seams. We pray for first responders of all kinds and for pastors, people seeking to bring about healing and reconciliation in violent and sick places. Lord, you have placed us here for such a time as this. And we believe that you have a plan and a purpose for us. Uh, we don't always know what that is, but we know that you do. And you have a plan and a purpose for us as a congregation. So, Lord, we pray that you would give us the ability to walk in step with your Holy Spirit. We pray for those that are uh, facing the loss of work, the loss of health, the loss of relationships. Uh, Lord, where there is loneliness and uh, lack, we pray that your provision will come and perhaps we can even be an answer to that. Lord, whatever's on our hearts or minds, you know it. And we lift it up to you, praying the prayer that you taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts. As we forgive our debtors, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Lord, you are holy. It is awesome to worship you in your presence. And lift up our hands For the joy of the Lord is our strength We bow down and worship Him now How great, how awesome is He Together we sing Everyone sing Holy is the Lord God Almighty The earth is filled
While we have one more week of online services, this may be the last virtual benediction that I give. Friends, it's been quite a journey, and I'm thankful for each and every one of you. So now let us go out into the world in peace. Have courage. Return no one evil for evil, but strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the suffering. Honor everyone. Love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. Now to him who is able to keep us from falling, to present us before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, power, and authority before all ages, now, and forevermore. Amen.